Well, good morning to you. It's the first Sunday in 2021, and I wish you every blessing in the new year. May God be with you. May you know his grace and may you know his peace. We are in lockdown and our building for a short while is closed, but we're thankful that we can still proclaim God's word across the internet. Please, would you open your Bible to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, reading from verse 1 to verse 18. Today we're going to look at a text which has spurred Christians over the years to intercessory prayer. This text has been used by God to stir people up to seek him. And many, on many occasions, God has used this text to revive his people. I wonder if you can spot the text that we're going to look at as we read through this passage. So let's read from verse 1 of 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Solomon has been praying as the temple of God has been dedicated to him. It's taken seven years to build and this is what we read. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple and the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their fa faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord saying, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. And the priests attended to their services. The Levites also with instruments of the music of the Lord, which David had made to praise the Lord, saying, For his mercy endures forever. Whenever David offered praise by their ministry, the priests sounded trumpets opposite them while all Israel stood. Furthermore, Solomon consecrated the middle of the court that was in front of the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of peace offerings, because the bronze altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings, the grain offerings and the fat. At that time, Solomon kept the feast seven days and all Israel with him a very great assembly from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt. And on the eighth day, they held a sacred assembly, for they observed the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. On the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people away to their tents, joyful and glad of heart for the good things that the Lord had done for David, for Solomon and for his people Israel. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and Solomon successfully accomplished all that came into his heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself, a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence amongst my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked and do according to all that I have commanded you and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom as I covenanted with David your father saying, you shall not fail to have a man as ruler in Israel. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot them 
from my land which I have given them, and this house which I have sanctified for my name, I will cast out of my sight, will make it a proverb and a byword among the peoples. Shall we seek God's face in prayer? Let's all pray. Loving and eternal God in heaven, we thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are a God who is holy and you are a God, Lord, who requires your people to be holy. We know, O oh Lord, that there is nothing better than, Lord, worshipping you in the beauty of holiness and serving you and obeying your commandments. But Lord, we have to confess to you this morning that there are many things that we have thought and said and done that have grieved your heart. And Lord, we confess to you this day that at times we have, Lord, served the idols of our generation. We have served, Lord, the the love of money or the love of entertainment and pleasure and leisure of food or we have put family before you and father we pray that you would forgive us and you would restore us we pray that we would find all of our pleasure and all of our joy in you and that we would truly be selfless people who take up our cross and follow the lord jesus day by day father we thank you that your word tells us that righteousness exalts a nation but sin is a reproach to any people And Lord, to us is shame of face, because we as your people and your nation have turned against you in so many ways. Oh, Father in heaven, we pray that you forgive us. Lord, we pray that you would have mercy upon a a nation and a world that aborts a baby so easily. Lord, forgive us, oh Lord, for the way in which we have turned your laws upside down where we have been perverse in the area of sexuality and identity, where, Heavenly Father, that we have, Lord, strayed from you, we have not loved the orphan, we have not loved the widow, we have not cared for the poor, but, Lord, we have lived for ourselves and our selfish desires in so many ways. O God in heaven, have mercy upon us. But, Lord, we thank you that with you there is forgiveness, And with you, Lord, there is mercy that you might be feared. And Father, we thank you that your church is clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We thank you that you love your church, that we are your own special people, your own treasured possession. And Lord, we belong to you and you belong to us. And Father, we thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit, that he will not allow us to fall away. But Lord, we thank you that though we may suffer chastening, We praise your God that for the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ and for your own glory, you will revive your church and you will strengthen your people. And we thank you that you are changing us from one degree of glory into the next as you mould us into the image of Christ. So, Father, in 2021, we ask, O God, that you would help us to continue to make small steps and perhaps large strides in our walk of holiness and we pray father that truly we might run with endurance the race that is set before us so be with us now as we look into your word we pray for those who are grieving in our fellowship that you'll be near to them we pray for those who are sick and unwell that you'll strengthen them pray for those who are burdened for their families that you'll give them peace and we pray heavenly father that you would do us good in 2021 We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm sure you've guessed the text that we're going to look at. It's a very well-known text for the Christian church. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. If my people were called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, we need to look first of all at the context of this verse before we apply it directly to ourselves. As I said at the beginning, it took seven years for Solomon and God's people to build this magnificent temple. There'd been a building 
not like it in all the world, magnificent. And Solomon, having built the, the temple, dedicates it, and he dedicates it with prayer. And in chapter 6, we see a man who is concerned for God's people. He knows their propensity. He knows the propensity of his own heart to stray from God. And so he prays in this way, Lord, if, if we should stray, and if we should suffer your judgments, Lord, then if we turn back to you, will you not hear from heaven, your dwelling place? Will you not forgive and will you not restore? He's a man who understands the covenant promises and the covenant curses of God. He understands that God has said to his people, he's in covenant with them, that if they will obey his commands, his statutes and his laws, then prosperity will come upon the land physically. There were no crops growing, there were no an abundance, their children will be plentiful, their animals will yield their offspring, and God will bless them. But if they disobey God, if they turn to idols, if they break his Sabbaths, if they dishonour him, then God will shut up the heavens, there'll be no rain, there'll be famine, there'll be pestilence, they'll be given over to their enemies. And Solomon is concerned that God's people would walk in his ways. But he also pleads with God and pleads the covenant promises. Look at chapter 6 and verse 26. There he says to the Lord, Lord, if you should shut up the heavens and not give rain because we've sinned against you, if then your people would turn back to you, confess your name, turn from their sins, will you not hear from heaven and forgive them? Will you not send the rain again upon the earth? Then he says in verse 28, if there should be famine, pestilence, blight or mildew, if the plagues of grasshoppers or locusts should come upon the land, if you should give us over to foreign invaders, Lord, whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone or by all your people, when each one knows his own burden and his own grief and spreads out his hands to this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and forgive and give to everyone according to all of his ways, whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of the sons of men. So Solomon has been praying and pleading the covenant promises of God, that God would be true to all that he has said. And we read in chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, of how God answered that prayer. Fire fell from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices that had been put in the temple. And the glory of the Lord filled that temple. I imagine a light that was so bright that people were, were blinded by it. You see that nobody could enter the temple. The priests couldn't go in to serve the Lord whilst the glory of the Lord was there. And in fact, the people outside, they fell on their faces, on the ground with their faces to the pavement, and they worshipped the Lord with fear and trembling, but with great joy. And they exclaimed, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endures forever. God had answered Solomon's prayer with signs from heaven, fire falling, consuming the sacrifice. God was with his people. And so there was this time of dedication. For seven days, they dedicated the altar of the Lord. For seven days, there was a time of feasting. And the Israelites went back eventually to their, hen their tents with joy and with gladness in their hearts. And then God appears a second time to King Solomon. And he appears at night. We read this in verse 12. And he says to Solomon, I've heard your prayer, not just in the generality, but in the specifics. You have prayed about the rain not falling. You've prayed about me shutting up the heaven. You've prayed about the pestilence. You've prayed about the locusts. Well, Solomon, I've heard your prayers in the detail. And I will answer specifically, if you, yes, you, my people, come back to me at such times. You humble yourselves. You pray. You seek my face. I will be true to my promise. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive. 
and I will heal your land. So today we look at this passage, but before we um, look at the passage, the, the verse word by word, I think we need to say this, we must not pull it out of context. We must not apply it directly to the UK or to the United States or to Nigeria or to South Korea, nations which have had a recent Christian history or a past Christian history. Why do I say that? Well, we are not as nations in covenant with the living God. God has only ever made a covenant with his people, whether Old Testament people under an old covenant or New Testament people under a New Testament. And so these covenant promises of God that he will restore his people when they pray to him is not a promise that is made to the world. Rather, it's made to God's people. Now, why is that important? Well, some people believe this. If the church seeks God and humbles itself and prays, automatic blessing will fall upon the nation. There's a part truth in that, but not a complete truth. You see, when the New Testament church was revived, they humbled themselves and times were refreshing came from the presence of the Lord. They still had a wicked Nero there were still many ungodly laws and practices going on in the Roman Empire. Some would say that the state of Great Britain at the moment is not as bad as it was during New Testament times. So we cannot apply this directly to nations. And neither can we apply this verse, verse 14, directly to the New Testament church. Why? Because this is promising physical prosperity to Israel. It is promising that their land will yield crops, that God will heal their land. You see, the prosperity teachers of our day, who sadly have infiltrated many churches throughout the world, particularly in the States and, and Africa and South America, they teach that if you humble yourself, if you have times of fasting and prayer and repentance, and God will come to the church and he will not only bless it spiritually, but you'll be blessed with prosperity, riches, health and wealth. That is a misapplication of this verse. So we cannot take the verse out of context, but then how do we apply it? Well, I want to suggest that it can be applied to us in greater ways than we, we imagine. You see, there are always principles in the scripture which run throughout the Bible. And one of the big principles is this, if, if a person humbles themselves before the Almighty God, and if a people, if a church humble themselves, God draws near. The contrite spirit, the lowly spirit, God loves. And when we humble ourselves and seek God's face for his name's sake, God has promised that he will draw near to us, he will revive us, will bless us. It's always true that when God's people humble themselves, God shows great favour to his people. If you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he will exalt you. And when God's people repent, to remind ourselves, this is a verse for God's people, when we repent of our sins, times of refreshing come, clearing comes, vindication comes. Look at what Paul said to the Corinthian church after they had repented. You sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. Yes, now you have an indignation against sin. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. That's always been true. As God's people, by his grace, have turned from sin and turn back to him with wholehearted hearts. God has come and blessed them with zeal and with a new vigour. They have truly been restored. So the title for today's message is this, A Call to Repentance and Restoration. 
Now we're going to look at three things today. First of all, we're going to look again at who is being addressed. I want to consider the words, my people, called by my name. Secondly, what is required of us? We're going to look at each word, prayer, seeking his face, and humbling ourselves before him. But then what is promised? God will hear from heaven. He will forgive and he will heal. So who is addressed? If my people who are called by my name. Now you may have thought that it is the world who ought to be addressed because of its sins. We make an assessment of the world and we are shocked at the decadence and the wickedness the flagrant breaking of God's law. The governments dismay us and we see a moral landslide on every side. And we might have thought that God would address the nations. Well, does, God does call all men everywhere to repent, but he always calls his people, us, to have our house in order. And God knows that the solution to the, the wickedness in the world is not to be found in governments, is not to be found in our petitioning them, in our writing letters, in, our being, in, our, in the church being strident. Of course, we must speak out, just as Herod was, sorry, that John the Baptist would speak against Herod's sin. Of course, we mustn't be silent. But God knows that the solution is not found there. The solution is found in the church. Do we really believe that God is the solution? Do we really believe that us humbling ourselves and praying to God is actually much better than writing a letter to an MP? Now, it's never either or, but the seeking of God shows that we believe that it's God ultimately who can turn the hearts of men. And we realise that, first of all, the church needs to be dealt with. Because unless we are a light, unless we are salt, unless we are what we ought to be, how will the world see Jesus Christ? Some of our evangelical publications at times do not help if they give the impression that the evil is out there in the world and we need to address it. And the problem is not in our hearts and in the church. You see, we are part of the problem, the backsliding, the materialism, the worldliness. Is there not a danger at times for us to be like the Pharisees, looking at the world and pointing out its sins without looking at ourselves first of all? And so God in this verse says to Solomon, yes, when God's people realise their, sin, their sinful state, if they pray to me and seek my face, then I will forgive them and I will restore them and I will bless their land. And surely if we humble ourselves, God will come to us and revive his church and that will bring, bring blessing to the nation, not prosperity, physical prosperity, but the nation will know that there is a God amongst his people and many will turn to him. So who is being addressed? My people. Now, can you hear the tender tones? My people who are called by my name. We are his own treasure possession. It's wonderful, isn't it? If you can say, these people are my people. I belong to them and they belong to me. Something very personal about that. And God is saying, yes, my people, even if they sin, they're still my people. But when they come back to me and call upon me, because they bear my name, they're called by my name, I will come to them. I love them. I desire their blessing. I long for it. And if they should humble themselves, then I will do that which I have promised to do. So the first thing we need to say this morning is this. In our assessment of the world, have we assessed ourselves? Do we see that the problem is just out there in the sinful world? Or do we recognise that we are part of the problem? Do we see the great sin, 
that's in the church. Bishops denying the resurrection, the virgin birth. Do we see many Christians given over to pleasure, pleasure, no self-sacrifice, serving the gods of this world? Do we assess ourselves and see who we really are? Well, God is addressing his people. But secondly, what is required of us? Well, what was required of God's people then? To humble themselves. You see, the Lord knew that so easy, his, easily his people could become self-sufficient. They could forget him and not depend upon him, but depend upon themselves. Didn't he say to them, when you go into the promised land and when you inherit homes that you have not built and vineyards that you have not dug, beware lest you forget me. At times of prosperity, God's people so often turn away from him. They do not pray. They do not seek him. And so we ask ourselves, have we forgotten God? How important is prayer to us? How important is God's word to us? Louis Zamperini, once who ran the Olympics in 1939 for the United States, congratulated by Hitler for the final lap of he ran so quickly of the one mile. Somebody who was proposed to be the first person to run a mile under four minutes. He didn't. He ended up in a prisoner of war camp in Japan. He tells his story of how they were so famished, the prisoners of war in the Japanese concentration camps, that they longed for any scrap of food. Yes, they hated the seaweed that was given to them, but they would eat anything. It was a desperate time. They were beaten, tortured, starved. They were famished. Well, we live in an ugly world, a sinful world. We of all people should be famished for the word of God and desire it earnestly. How hungry are you for God's word? I fear that many of us are sermon tasters. We go along to church, we taste a sermon. We take home that which we like and that which we didn't like, we discard. We go from one preach to the next, particularly under lockdown. We just get out our favourite preacher and uh, we don't really listen carefully to what God is saying to us. We don't read the Bible ourselves and we do not seek God in prayer. It's as if we have forgotten God. Such times there's a great need to humble ourselves before his majesty, before his might, before his glory. For me, it's a frightening thing when church becomes casual. We ought to know joy in his presence, but we ought to fear him. Could it be that we fiddle around on a phone and look at the latest feed well, whilst a sermon is being preached? Could it be that in a prayer meeting, we open our eyes and gaze around and think of other people and other things rather than seeking God? Could it be that while we're in church on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night, we're thinking more of going home Sunday morning, going back for the meal Sunday night, getting back to be with our, our family? Are we casual in God's presence or are we hungry for his word? Do we seek him? Do we have a critical spirit as God's people? Are we always looking on, criticising others? Or are we seeking God for himself? Is there not a great need for us to humble ourselves because of our sin, because of our lack of fear and genuine desire for him? When we do that, God draws near he loves the lowly and the contrite heart. He loves the broken soul. He loves the one who is prostrate before him, seeking him. He lifts them up. He strengthens them. How we need to humble ourselves. What is required of us to realise how sinful and weak we are and how great he is and to humble ourselves before him. But secondly, to pray and to seek his face. Now the word for prayer in the Hebrew is the word for intercede. You see, when Solomon built the temple, God had said that it would be a place of prayer for all nations. 
Yes, God had set his love upon the Jews, upon Israel, but his heart was for the nations and they were to pray for the nations. The Messiah was coming to set up a kingdom and all nations would come to him. They were to intercede. So we read here, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and intercede, intercede for the nations, intercede for others, then I will bless them. There's a word for you and me in that. How much of our praying is self-orientated, self-centered? My family, my needs, my church. Of course we ought to pray for our family. Of course we need to pray for ourselves. Of course we need to pray for the church. That is praying for others. But are we praying ultimately for Christ, for his glory, for his honor? And are we interceding for the world? We want his kingdom to come. The Apostle Paul prayed fervently for the church, that God would bless it. So many prayers in the New Testament are recorded of how Paul prayed for the church. He also prayed incessantly for the unbelieving Jews. His prayer to God for Israel was that they might be saved. I was very concerned when I read in one of our evangelical publications the thought that there is no requirement in the New Testament to pray for the unconverted. It reminded me of the ministers who sat down with William Carey when he told them of his desire to go to India. They turned to him and said, if the Lord wants to save the heathen, he'll do it himself. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need you. What an awful thought. We are to pray God's kingdom come. We are to pray and intercede for the unconverted. So, are we doing that? Are we humbling ourselves? And are we interceding? Interceding for God's people. Christ intercedes for us. He intercedes for God's people how we ought to intercede for the church. Praying for all the members of the church. Praying for other churches. Praying for pastors. Are we interceding? And are we interceding for the world? But then it also says this, we are to seek his face. What's that? Surely that's seeking God for himself. That's seeking intimacy with him, seeking his glory. Moses sought God and he spoke to God as a man speaks to his friend face to face. He knew glorious intimacy. And we see God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so as we seek God's face, we are seeking the honour of Jesus Christ. Do we know anything of that in our own private lives? Seeking God for himself. Lord, fill me. Lord, come to me. I want to know you. I want to know your character. Are we like that as a church? But then it says this, turning from our wicked ways. We're to pray, we're to seek his face, and we are to turn from our wicked ways. Now for Israel, that meant many things. It's spelt out in the Bible for us. They had fallen into idolatry as a nation. Often that happened. They worshipped the false gods, the Baals, the Ashtoreths of the pagan nations. They broke God's holy day, the Sabbath. They traded on the Sabbath. They worked on God's holy day. They intermarried the pagan peoples. They exploited the poor. They did not care for the widow or for the orden, or for the orphan. They broke God's holy law. And the Lord says, you need to turn from your wicked ways. You need to keep my Sabbath. You need to care for the orphan and the widow. You need to turn from idols and love me. You need to keep my commandments by my grace. And when they would turn from their wicked ways, with all the power and strength that God would enable them to do that, then God would forgive and God would restore. What about us? We've mentioned the gods of entertainment, of pleasure, of leisure, the idolatry of food, the idolatry of health, the idolatry of family, the idolatry of money gaining wealth, idolatry of materialism, the neglect of the living God. 
rampant sins in the area of sexuality, hidden sins. In our men's meeting, one of our men says, maybe this is one of the biggest things in the church. Outwardly, we seem fine, but how much is going on in our hidden lives? How we need to confess. What do you need to confess? We need to turn from our wicked ways. And then God has said he will hear from heaven his dwelling place and forgive. There was a man called Neil Postman 40 years ago and he wrote, wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And in this book, he describes what he believed would be the state of the world because of being overrun by um, modern media, by social media and by computers and the way in which we communicate. He said this, he believed that in politics, it would be more about the personality rather than the policy, it would be more about celebrity rather than the content. He believed in news, there would be a terrible thing that would happen, would, that the trivial would be cut, put alongside the, the serious and we would become desensitised. And he said within the church, it would become more about entertainment than content. And he was an atheist 40 years ago writing. And hasn't that come to pass? Oh, how we need to humble ourselves. How we need to pray. How we need to seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. But then lastly, let's listen to what God has promised. He will hear from heaven. When we guard iniquity in his, our hearts, he will not hear us. For your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. When we do not confess, he will not hear. But Proverbs 28 verse 13, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. We cover our sins, we do not prosper. We confess and forsake and we receive the mercy of God. Thank God for Calvary. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank God that all of our sin is dealt with there. Oh, that we would come to the cross of Christ and know that cleansing again. 1 John 1 verse 9, a verse that's been so helpful to Christians throughout the centuries. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Come to Christ, come to the cross, be real with him, ask him to forgive you and he will cleanse you and he will restore you and you will know inner spiritual healing. For the Israelites, he said, I will heal your land. Oh, that he would come and heal our churches, the divisions, the lack of love, the tensions, the legalism, the hurt, the hidden sins. Oh, that God would come and revive us and restore us for his own name's sake. He has given wonderful promises. This is his desire. My people, if you come like that, I will forgive. And I will hear your prayers. Maybe you've been praying, but you've been guarding iniquity in your heart and the blessing hasn't come. Prayers have not been heard. But if you turn from your wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive, and I will heal you. May in 2021, we prove the reality of 2 Chronicles 7.14, that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive, and will heal them. May God bless you and may be with you as a f in your family or alone. May we as a church and as churches know God's blessing. Amen.